This mini PC from Geekom is interesting. There's a lot to love, and also some stuff not to love, but it does have one major standout feature, and that's the 12th gen Intel CPU inside. In this video, I'm going to see how this performs in Windows, doing a few different tasks, but also explore how this might be beneficial in a home lab setup thanks to those fancy P and E cores, which made a much bigger difference than I expected, so stay tuned. If you're diving into the world of online selling, it can be quite daunting. Fortunately, the sponsor of today's video, Squarespace, makes it easy. Squarespace takes the hassle out of selling online, especially when it comes to payment options. They offer simple yet powerful tools that make checkout seamless for your customers. You can easily accept credit cards, PayPal, and Apple Pay. Plus, you can even give your customers the option to buy now and pay later using Afterpay and Clearpay. No more complicated payment processes or frustrating hurdles. Squarespace takes care of all the nitty gritty details, leaving you free to just focus on growing your business. If you're looking to start selling online or just simplify your current workflow, check out Squarespace. After giving things a go with a free trial, you can go to squarespace.com slash hardwarehaven and use code hardwarehaven to get 10% off your first website or domain purchase. So start selling with Squarespace today. If you guys watch the channel, you know I love three things. Used desktop PCs, NAS appliances, and little guys like this. So I couldn't really pass up the chance to take a look at a mini PC with an Intel 12th gen mobile CPU, because while this thing might be possibly out of your price range, and mine for that matter, I think it's worth taking a look at, because even if you can't afford one of these now, in a few years, 12th and 13th gen Intel devices will most likely be much more affordable on the used market. The hybrid architecture of these CPUs is fairly interesting, and I felt like this was worth exploring primarily from a home lab perspective. Later in this video, I'm going to mess around with pinning CPU cores to either P or E cores to see how that can improve efficiency and maybe even performance. Now, just for the sake of transparency, Geekom did send this over, but that was with the expectation that I can say whatever I want. No money was exchanged and never will be on this channel, unless you see or hear the words sponsored by. Like when I say, this video is sponsored by Squarespace. I'm just kidding, I'm not gonna. All right, moving on. So what is this thing? Well, it's the Geekom Mini IT12. And if we check out the Amazon marketing, we can learn a lot about it. First of all, we can see that the 12th gen CPU has 21,038, which is a bigger number than those other two numbers. And this makes it blue, which is good. <laughs> I can't, I'm sorry. I had fun looking at the Amazon marketing materials. Anyway, okay, actually, actually serious now. As I mentioned, this does have a 12th gen mobile CPU, the i7-1260P, which has four P or performance cores that can boost to 4.7 gigahertz and eight E or endurance cores that can boost up to 3.4 gigahertz. Now, if you're watching this video, you're probably aware, but starting with Intel's 12th gen CPUs, there are now two different types of cores. P cores with higher clock speeds and hyper-threading, and E cores. These have lower clocks and lack hyper-threading. This configuration comes with 16 gigabytes of DDR4, as well as a 512 gigabyte PCIe Gen 4 NVMe drive. And this actually brings me to one of my favorite things about this system, which is how simple and easy it is to open up. There aren't any glued on rubber feet over the screw holes or plastic clips to break off. It's just four screws and you're in. Aha! Oh, and the screws are actually captive, so you don't have to go hunting them down with a magnet when you inevitably drop them on your carpet. See, this is this is a great feature, Geekom. Why not put this on your mar Amazon marketing? Oh gosh, I'm gonna break this cable. Inside, there's also a 42 millimeter SATA M.2 slot, as well as a ribbon cable that goes to a two and a half inch drive bay. I really like the drive options and how accessible it is. However, the ribbon cable for the two and a half inch drive seems to not be in the best spot as it often wanted to get itself pinched when closing the case. It's a small detail, but I don't imagine this cable is super easy to find and replace. The front and rear IO is decent with three USB 10 gigabit per second type A ports, a USB 2.0 port, two HDMI ports, headphone jack, 
and even an SD card slot on the side. There's also a two and a half gigabit network port, which is to be expected on a higher end system like this. And also there are two USB 4, 40 gigabit per second USB ports, but I'm not entirely sure if these support Thunderbolt. I, I really don't quite understand the whole Thunderbolt USB thing still. These aren't ever marketed as Thunderbolt and I couldn't get any drivers working. I, I tested it with a Thunderbolt 2 audio interface and I couldn't get it working. I reached out to Geekom to see if they have any answers. I ran a few benchmarks, starting with Cinebench R23, and this is where things get interesting. First of all, the fan was rather noticeable and pretty annoying. Also, when starting the test, power draw would shoot up to around 80 watts, and the CPU temps would also skyrocket. But then a few seconds later, the power would drop down to around 44 watts or so, and the thermals would be much more manageable. Now, this is to all be expected with how Intel Turbo works, but it made me decide to dig into the BIOS to see if there were any power management options or things of that nature. I was a bit disappointed to find that the BIOS setup menu is pretty bare, only offering a few boot settings and a fan setting. I messed around with the three fan profiles and found that the quieter setting did help the fan a bit, but noticeably impacted performance. I couldn't tell a difference between the normal and performance profiles in terms of noise, but the performance was slightly better on the highest profile. I don't imagine anyone is buying this type of system and not looking for the best performance, so I decided to stick with the performance profile for the rest of the video. In Cinebench R23 Multicore, the IT12 achieved a score of 8234. To give some comparison, my desktop with an i7-9700 scored an 8904, and my Minis Forum UM690 with its Ryzen 9 6800HX scored a 12265. The i7-1260P doesn't look incredible stacked up against these, especially the Ryzen 9, but it's important to note that outside of the initial boost, the Ryzen system pulled roughly 50% more power to achieve that roughly 50% higher score. But all of that is when running multi-core workloads. In the single core test, the IT12 comes away with a solid lead over both the Ryzen 9 6900HX from the Minis Forum, as well as my desktop's i7-9700, meaning this CPU is going to handle most single-threaded workloads really well. I also ran Cinebench R15, which really isn't the best test for modern CPUs because it finishes so quickly, but that sort of makes it a good test for short workloads, where the turbo capabilities of this chip might excel. And compared to the older 9700, it does just that. I also ran PC Mark 10, so here's how that went. I was curious how the newer Iris XE graphics would handle some games, and while things weren't terrible by any means, this is still Intel integrated graphics. I achieved pretty competitive performance in Rocket League, but the weaker GPU became much more apparent in something like Doom, where typically 60 frames per second on medium settings shouldn't be an issue for decent hardware, but unfortunately we couldn't achieve that here. And things got even worse for the 1260p when throwing Kingdom Come Deliverance at it. We are clearly GPU bottlenecked here. I also tried out some video editing in Adobe Premiere, where I think something like the IT12 could be really useful, and it handled 4K footage and some effects with absolutely no issues. And the 2.5 gigabit connection means you could probably do a lot of editing directly off of network storage. Now, using this as a desktop is cool and all, but I really wanted to see how this would work in a home server environment. And more specifically, I wanted to take advantage of the P cores and E cores. When running VMs, you don't allocate cores in the same way you do with memory. Multiple virtual machines might be using the same cores at the same time, and you can actually have more cores given out to a variety of virtual machines than are actually present on the CPU. However, you can make a virtual machine only use specific cores using CPU pinning or processor affinity. With the hybrid architecture of the 1260p, I was curious if certain workloads might be more efficient if they were pinned to only the efficient cores. So I decided to mess around a bit in Proxmox. First, I obviously installed Proxmox, and then made three virtual machines. On the first, I installed Debian 11, and then just for the sake of time, installed Casa OS so that I could quickly spin up a few Docker containers. These were all containers that really wouldn't need a ton of horsepower, but would be running constantly, like Home Assistant, Pi-hole, and Uptime Kuma. 
On the second VM, I did exactly the same thing, but only spun up a single Docker container, which was a paper Minecraft server. On the third VM, I ran Ubuntu desktop and then installed Handbrake. And my thought here was that this might sort of simulate a VDI use case or a server for offloading video re-encoding or rendering or something like that. Something that you would want to have really good performance when needed, but is typically just sitting idle. As a baseline, I ran everything without setting any CPU affinity. And when running all the containers, the Minecraft server, and with the Ubuntu desktop just sitting idle, the system pulled around 24 watts. Now, I wanted to see what improvements could be made by pinning some cores. So first, I needed to figure out which cores were which. So I took a look at slash proc slash CPU info, which lists info about each thread. On the first thread, zero, the core ID was also listed as zero. The next thread also listed the core ID as zero, which means threads zero and one belong to a P core because P cores are the only ones that have hyper threading. I looked through the rest to confirm that the first eight threads, so zero through seven, were all hyper threaded. That meant that my E cores were going to be threads eight through 15. So on my first virtual machine with all the Docker containers, I set the CPU affinity to eight through 15 and then restarted the system. And you can see here when running HTOP on the host that only the last eight threads are being utilized. I played around a bit and found that when I assigned everything to just the E cores, the power usage when running all the containers as well as the Minecraft server came down to around 17 or 18 watts. Now that's a nice decrease, but we also aren't using our P cores for anything now. So I shifted the Ubuntu system over to threads zero through seven to let it take advantage of the P cores, which could really help with things like rendering or even remote gaming. And surprisingly, this only brought us up to around 18 or maybe 19 watts, which to me is fairly impressive. That's about 20% less power for basically the exact same performance and our workloads. Plus, if I were to hop into that Ubuntu desktop and start encoding something in Handbrake, our Minecraft server and other containers shouldn't really be affected, as the Ubuntu VM won't touch those E cores. To be fair, this would probably only save you a few dollars a year in electricity costs, even with higher energy prices, but it's still cool nonetheless. I'm curious to see how this might scale in a more high powered server. And I'm also curious to hear your thoughts or how you might be interested in maybe taking advantage of this down the road. So let me know in the comments below. I'm actually pretty impressed with this thing. The fan is a bit annoying, but I don't think, at least for me, that I'd ever end up having it on my desk. It would probably be tucked away somewhere. Although that might not be the case for you, so yeah. It seems to have some pretty solid performance for a relatively low power draw, and while something like the UM690 might outclass it in multi-threaded scenarios, that system is also a fair bit more expensive and is less impressive in single-threaded scenarios. I do love how small it is, and it is really small, but I can't help but wonder if the noisy fan and thermals would be better if they made it just slightly bigger. I think that also might have helped with the ribbon cable issue. Being able to easily open this up, though, is awesome, and it kind of feels like Geekom embraces people actually using all of these internal slots on the PC they bought. Good job. I would have loved to have seen dual 2.5 gigabit NICs, but I guess we do have these USB 4 ports, and if you really need dual NICs, ASRock does make a barebone system that has dual 2.5 gigabit NICs, but I have no idea how that's going to perform, so take that with a grain of salt. If you're interested in the Mini IT12, I will have links down in the description that you can check out and help support the channel. You can also support the channel by heading over to the Patreon or by joining a membership here on YouTube, because I have that set up now. For a dollar a month, you can get early access to videos as well as some behind the scenes, like a video I just did recently where I break down the entire process of how I make these videos. Now, I do want to thank Geekcom really quick for sending this over and making this whole thing possible, and I think that's about it. So, as always, thank you guys so much for watching. Oh, hold on. Seriously, you guys, thank you for watching. You helped me get this, and that's pretty cool. So, thank you for watching. Stay curious, and I can't wait to see you in the next one. So, you don't have to go hunting them down with a magnet when you inevitably... Inevitably... <laughs> Words are hard.